please. And we are live. There we go. Hey, everybody. Happy Tuesday. Two talk at 2.13 this week. <laughs> episode episode yeah, like five. It. Sorry about being late, folks. Very, uh... There's nothing pressing, so we're late. Exactly. So what? Yeah, well, hair and makeup. Hair and makeup takes a long time in this show. So, well, yeah. Not to mention where the hell Todd and go, Brent right? doing a fresh go? dye. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Todd so had thanks to run. For, thanks to everybody sure. for coming back. Uh, good show today. Um, first, uh, right off the top, I guess, uh, Brent, we missed you last week. Uh, how's everything going? Do you want to know? Without getting into all the gory eye details like we've done so many times. No, 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 no. Uh... Get into all the gory eye details. I'm good. I'm so good. I think what happened is we had a conversation with Danko Jones, Todd and I, about our, our uh, eyes detaching. And uh, <laughs> so I just had to keep it going. One more surgery. No, um, I had a cataract surgery on this eye, so it's 100%. So I've had six surgeries. Todd, how many surgeries have you had? Uh, well, um, most of it's reconstructive, as you can tell. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but a couple of eye surgeries as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think between the two of us, we're we're done. But it was cool to be a guest of watching you guys, you know, or not a guest, but like a, a um, you know, a looky loo. I actually you know, <laughs> wasn't there for it, and then I watched it later, and I was like, hey, that was pretty pretty uh, pretty cool. So yeah, good to be back though. Yeah, good to have awesome. you, man. We it's missed you. A long way. Missed you guys. That picture you you sent out fits with your eye was all swollen and gnarly looking. Well, oh, it was dude. just like, and the patch is always the, the crazy thing, but it was a clear patch this time. So, but you know, after you get a cataract surgery, you actually see right away because, you know, they're putting a new lens in your eye where when Todd and I've had these retina detachment surgeries, you know, your eyes just like wrecked for, for quite some time. So it's good to be back. I can see you guys. I don't have my reading glasses on even right now. So it's amazing. Wow. wow. Nice. Cool. Actually, you should see what you look like after this other surgeries though. It looks like you went like eight rounds with... Clubber Lang from Rocky Three. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> <laughs> or you were dry heaving for a whole week. Yeah, I, I will say this: I, it's about time I dyed my hair. How, how does everyone else feel? Jesus, it's like <laughs> yeah, you're real fresh. Yeah, my gray is kind of starting to peek yeah. through here on the side. I, I have, I have no idea what you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. 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 That's all Todd, went, Todd right? went reverse. Yeah. He let the hair down and shaved the beard. So you know. Exactly. I know, Todd. Actually, that yeah. was great. Like the last couple of weeks, I think. Uh, I can't grow a beard because it just doesn't grow right. But I have had a beard in my day. But uh, um, <clears throat> that's that's the Todd I'm used to. Is the, <laughs> we might yeah, have some I know. early. I think we yeah, see sort of pictures of you uh, sporting the the facial hair there, Fitzy. Yeah. Well, I think a couple years ago on tour with Slash, I was like, all right, I'm going for the the uh, the beard. But my uh, my wife was like, do not come home with that beard. And I was like, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Uh -oh. So anyway, so uh, uh, I I I only have this beard because my wife requested it. So <laughs> it looks good on you, Corey. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And actually, what's funny is when we played together with Slash, you you sort of looked uh, like, I mean, I've known you a long time, and and when we first started this band, actually, your hair was really short. Yes, that's right. And yeah. Since then, <laughs> now you, yeah, full, really long hair and and beard. It's like it was like perfect timing for you to come into the Slash. Man. I know. Again, it's. It I was like he's his uniform. Been, I think he's been avoiding creditors. I think that's yeah. what's going on there. Well, no, yeah. I, I don't know if it's even <laughs> saw last week. Uh, these two guys were vying for the lead role in Jesus Christ Superstar. So it's safe to say that we, we can <laughs> see we've got the role. Todd went back to shaving. And, you know. That's right. Exactly. exactly. It's funny because. I, I, to be I, fair, I, though, I did get the role of Cher in the upcoming <laughs> Saint Cher film. So that's uh, cool. <laughs> I talked to Corey earlier in the week and I was like, he was helping me fix something on my computer. I'm like, is that? It's like, that's Corey. It, but it was like not Corey. You know what I mean? It's like that beard is so thick now that it's kind of hard to recognize him. I'm turning Jedi. into my brother. There you go. Turning yeah. into grow, Shane, can you grow facial hair? Have you ever like rocked it? <clears throat> it just it drives me nuts. Like me too, dude. Week, I just go crazy. I gotta shave it off. Yeah. I'm when you have long hair, as you know, Corey. <laughs> play guitar or whatever on stage as soon as your hair is like on your face it's that's just the other not... thing. That's oh it's the worst with facial hair because it just sticks it won't leave and then you're just grow, eating yeah. it the whole show yeah. right totally so yeah. uh gotta get good yeah so i mean we we've got a good show coming up we've got some great guests today but i mean as always everybody wants to know what have you guys been up to what's uh 
what's isolation like in week five now, I guess, or week five of this show anyways. So anything new and exciting going on? Oh, yeah. I hung a new uh, swing in my backyard off my tie, tree. A tire a swing? swing. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I replaced an old swing that was there. It was kind of dilapidated, decrepit old swing I hung up there with my dad like 15 uh, That's so, awesome. I, I painted it like, like 10 times. You know, you put stain on it, you try and keep it all together, nail it back together, and screw it back together. But after 15 years, it was like time to get a new one. So I've kind of been tinkering around <clears> nice. that couple of days coming a little they open the trails always... down in la here so uh, i've been getting out on the trails and doing some running and trying to s stay fit from all the uh couch potato netflix binging that i've been doing see that's good i noticed you uh shane and Corey, are definitely the the guys that are venturing out into the i mean it's the landscape there in la is awesome where you guys live so that's pretty yeah, it's cool. great todd how about you yeah yeah got um I have like uh, same as last week. I've been literally sitting here in front of the computer waiting for you guys to call me. So here we are. Did you just get that shirt, or was that in your wardrobe? This shirt. This is. Uh, oh yeah, I changed shirts. I guess. Yeah, I don't know what. It's just a. It's, it's a. It's pretty Canadian. It's a. What do you call it? Like a plaid kind of shirt. Flannel. The, uh, yeah. Mostly just been kind of hanging out. Uh, you know. I, I go out all the time, but I, I haven't really actually seen anybody. This is week uh, – Monday will be eight weeks for me, which is enough already. It's time to go out and, yeah. I don't know, do something. So yeah. it, it, has there been any change on your front? I mean, not that it obviously changes the entire, you know, pandemic in, in a whole, but have they kind of loosened the reins a little bit where you guys are, or is it still locked down as, as it was, say, a couple of weeks ago? <clears throat> Well, we know um, in Vegas, like, right, Todd, Monday, they opened up a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, well, I was able to have surgery, so I think that says it right there. They called me on a Thursday, and uh, on Monday, they were opening up the city to um, restaurants. Does that sound right, Todd? Restaurants and, like, hair salons now, and a few restaurants, things. But, restaurants but that's yeah. about it. in, or do you just, is it takeout only? Really? Um. Yeah, restaurants dine wow. in, but I think with limited spacing, and they might take yeah. your temperature. And and uh, I was talking to Todd yesterday. I was like, "Are you going to venture out to a restaurant?" It's like it just seems weird, hey, to, to go out and do that yet. I know. It, I'm not really in a hurry to experience that just yet. The uh, weird, awkward, you know, you know, four tables in a in a 50 person restaurant just seems weird to me. But you know. At some point, we're all going to have to kind of take this in at some point. They don't need me yet. The world doesn't need me yet. So I'm just kind of like, I'm just sitting here at the ready. When they say it's time to go, I'm ready to go. I drove down the strip, actually, because the day after my surgery, I went for a follow-up. And, right. uh, and you had already been down the strip. And I was like, well, if things open up soon, I just want to have a look. So I drove. And really, there was not a lot of cars and really no humans other than the odd person, like, you know, riding a bike down the strip, probably mm -hmm. to say they did it. But yeah. it was eerie because it just it's, felt so like there's nothing, there's no energy, you know. Any of those places that have, you know, like say Times Square or or Beale yeah. Street or Broadway or or any of those places, uh, Bourbon Street, you know, they've got to be just very unusual to be there and just see it so quiet. It probably always looks like early Sunday morning all day yeah. long. So yeah. that's a little weird. Yeah, I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, the the Vegas Strip must be. Uh... An awkward, uh, awkward sight to see now because that's usually just nothing but people, right? It's super yeah. surreal. Yeah, I, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, yeah. Well, that sounds like everybody's having an exciting time. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, this is the most excitement I get all week. All right. So let's 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 yeah, talk. Yeah, so to people. Uh, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, good show. So who wants to make the introduction? Um, you know, I'm sure our, our first guest is uh, waiting in the wing. Corey, he's in yeah. our green room. He's in our green he's room green enjoying room. our uh, free yeah. snacks. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so our first guest is Canadian, played with a band called Honeymoon Suite. Still, still does. Plays. They're yeah. still making music. They're still awesome. Uh, I, I had a chance to meet this guy uh, on tour with Shania, and we became the best of friends. <laughs> and um, we're so happy to have Mr. Derry Graham. Yay! Hey, Derry. Hey, How are you, sir? Excellent. Thanks for having me. 
Is it warming up out there? You're in Chicago or in the Illinois area these days. No. So it's, it's, cold. it's still cold? No. Oh. It's, it's just shitty and cold. Yeah. That yeah. sucks. Mm -hmm. So how, how much have you had, like, postponed on you during all of this? I'm assuming you guys are probably ready to head out, like, every week you must have something going on, huh? Everything is gone, man. Everything. Yeah. We're supposed to yeah. stop in, in March. But everything from March indefinitely now, the whole summer is gone. The fall yeah. is gone. Everything. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. crazy, right? Yeah, same. You guys are probably the same. Anybody got any work coming up? No. 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 So I bet we would have been doing a couple shows together this summer, like a festival, or it was probably guaranteed we were we would have crossed paths. So oh, I but, know. I mean, yeah. love you guys. We almost did. We were in we were in Vancouver one time at the same day. You guys were playing another venue. Like, That's right. That's right. And you were playing a different venue, and then I was over, and and I wanted to really get up to see you, but we're kind of on on the same time, so I just missed. But I will I will see you guys. I will. There will come a time. There will come it, a it'll time. work out cross paths man absolutely but i, just I was trying it's it's everything it's just gone and people are saying there's no shows <clears throat> till 2021 i'm like what the hell i Why know for six months i honestly think like i want to start playing in august or september i don't see why we couldn't but then you know gotta wait and see Bang, <clears throat> playing in half empty uh, venues or like uh, as some friends have been pitching to me, like drive-in concerts, like a festival heard, show and people drive up in their cars. And I'm like, is that what it's come to, dude? Like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I actually heard that the other day. I had to laugh. I we could roll around on people, the hoods of people's cars like Tawny Katane in a White Snake video. <laughs> <would> be amazing. <laughs> so, Derry, were you guys in the middle of a run when this all went down? Or were you guys just looking forward to getting out on the road and then found out that it wasn't going to happen? No, it was like in, in the winter time. Well, I mean, we do mostly weekends and stuff in the summer. And in the winter, it's a couple shows a month. And we had two or three things in, in March. It's not, it's not a run, just right. one-offs. And so we played in February in Ontario. And then March came around and everything started going down. Yeah, and then that's April, crazy. And then May. And then June, you know, and on and on. So same. It's the same for all of us. Yeah, it's like you know we're waiting because even stuff that I'm thinking like, you know, a show in uh, in October, November, that's got to be fine, right? And then all of a yeah. sudden, that's starting to look dubious as well. I know it's. I know. It's I upsetting. Know. I I don't know, man. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, and all you guys too. I mean, this is what we do. I know. Um, yeah. It's fun to be at home. I'm I'm playing a lot, as I'm sure you guys are getting yep. caught up. But you can only sit at home for so long. Right? Well, you know what? You you could be on Tube Talk every Tuesday forever now if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do that. Okay. So there's Tuesdays taken care of. Hey, Tuesdays. There you go. Just a couple more. So just so that everybody is aware that's watching, and of course uh, we get viewers from all over the world and people asking questions. Uh, Corey, why don't you go ahead and maybe discuss how Took and Honeymoon Suite kind of have something in common? I mean, people are obviously familiar right. with the material on the Took record, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so on our first album, Giver, uh, we covered um, New Girl Now, and this Derry is one of the writers of New Girl Now, and he, uh, and, and, and I know you've been doing some, uh, YouTube stuff showing how to play your songs and I wish you w would have done it like four years ago when we were recording this song, because <laughs> now I know that I wasn't playing the parts exactly like you did. Oh, wow. So now we gotta, we gotta redo it. We gotta recut the track. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Yeah. I see videos. You were talking about earlier about you guys playing, you know, honeymoon suite covers way back in the day yeah yeah yeah, yeah. A, they record stuff you know they record some of the songs and post them on youtube and it's really funny to watch somebody else play your stuff or play your solo yeah because they never get it exactly and i'm yeah. not that's not big right because every guitar player is different but it's interesting to watch somebody else's interpretation right yeah i think so i got the solo right though did i or or not did. I was saying this earlier. I mean, uh, of all the 
covers I've ever seen. You guys nailed it to a freaking T. Yeah. Because, wow. Well, you know, like <clears throat> there hasn't been, you know, you're like the highest level of players that's ever covered one of our oh, songs. Oh, you're wow. not, you're not bar band hackers, you know. You guys, <laughs> well, you guys we are, are but we're so, you, you know, you nailed it every every part, vocals and everything, man. Oh, really thanks. So, yeah. thanks. So I was playing. I was playing the honeymoon suite covers in '87 in bars when I was underage. Like because were, yeah. those songs were so very accessible. Everybody loved them in Canada, and we all. I mean, you know, like big choruses and that. But yeah, I remember like one of the first gigs I played. You know, I was 16 or 17, and I think New Girl Now and like Burning in Love were in in our set list. So. We uh, babies. Uh... Stay in the light. You know, all was through, yeah, yeah. Hey. My, my first band, well, pro band, was uh, was uh, Barracuda, which is a heart tribute. But we played a couple of the songs. That's yeah. funny. Love, new girl now. Nice. So, so nice. a girl singer had a new girl now. That's yeah. a whole new spin on that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> girls in the band. So speaking okay. of new girl now, uh, the, one of the most interesting things about new girl now is it was picked up like as a like you won like a, a radio contest with that song like before it ever signed. Am I right on that? Yeah, you guys remember the homegrown contest and yeah, and, uh, yeah. the Q one hundred seven thing. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's it. That's a different version then, right? There's another version of that song that you recorded back then or something? Is that how that works? Yeah. The first version was a demo. It was like an eight-track demo. Nice. Wow. And and it was, it was um, the lyric start, the song started out with Cold Winter Night. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, wow. Wow. In the air, okay? That was the original lyric that I wrote. Wow. And then after we got some Warners wanted to release it in the summertime, so they told me to change the lyric. And they wanted something uh, uh, more summer, so I had to change it to hot <laughs> summer like storm cloud. Nice. Wow. wow. Now you said you recorded that on an A track. Were you guys doing your own like engineering back in the day, or did you actually hire someone with an A track to record that? No, we had. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of a guy named Tom Tremuth. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, he's a producer, been around forever from Toronto, and he produced our first record. And around about that time we were working with him trying to get a record deal and he had a studio in his basement. So we had played like a six nighter, like an Elliot Lake finished on Saturday <laughs> and then drove home on Sunday to his house in Toronto and recorded that and three other songs in his basement. Then went back up to like Sudbury on Monday. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. As you do. Yeah. Yeah. As, as you did back then. Remember the six yeah. nighters? Absolutely. Yeah. We all talk about that because we all grew up in the West and on the prairies and all that. And in Canada back in those days, you could play six nights a week. So I'm assuming Ontario was very much the same idea. You could, and you, you couldn't do that. Like I don't think you could do that as much in the in the U.S. way back in the day. But as Canadians, we're pretty lucky because you could get a bar band together. You could play Sudbury and Timmins and Elliot Lake and Dryden and keep going west and oh, yeah. you do these nighters. You make no money, but you're working, you know. And totally. Whatever, you know. And you're hooking up with girls, and this is before Facebook, all that stuff. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, a lot of the time, you know, strippers would be staying in the same hotels. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we always tell those stories, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a, that's an interesting concept, but yeah, the fact that we co-mingled and played bars that also had dancers during the day. That was sort of a, a culture back in Canada. I don't know if it was the same in the States, but every guy that had a band in the mid to late 80s knew that we were, you know, we were sharing hotel, like the, the floor with, with mostly the dancers working there. Yeah, but the, the difference is you guys were pursuing music. They were trying to put themselves through school. Right. Of course they were. <laughs> They're always going back to school. Yeah. They were always going back to school. Exactly. Exactly. Anyway, so... Hey. We sent that demo into the Q107, I think it was 1983 or whatever, and it won that year. Yeah, that's it, amazing. It got the labels interested, and they started coming out. We did showcases, and long story short, then we got signed. So it that's worked. so cool. Was it called Honeymoon Suite from the get-go? Yeah, yeah, because Johnny, Johnny started the band about six months before I joined. So, oh, cool. so just in, yeah, just That's intervene there name. because uh, again, people are asking, and again, you know, not everybody's familiar with the region. Um, seems obvious to all of us, of course, you know, being Canadian and knowing. But 
Can you maybe give some insight as to, you know, why the name? Well, Johnny D, the, the singer, is uh, from Niagara Falls, Ontario. Yes. That's where he that's where he grew up. OK, so Niagara Falls is known as the honeymoon capital of the world. That's right. Uh, right. That's right. A Canadian tourist thing, like the Canadian side. So totally. Johnny was there and he st he started the band and, and some friend of his suggested to call it Honeymoon Suite because he was from the falls. I grew up right next door in a, a little city called St. Catharines. Ah, great town. Very close, yeah. but I never, Johnny and I both grew up in the same area, but we never knew each other until we were both living in Toronto much later. That's so okay. that, that's yeah. how the name happened. You know what I want to ask you, Derry? How did, the, the story is that Johnny D, the lead singer for Honeymoon Suite, got his leg broken at LAX. And it's always yeah. like, what happened between like grabbing your bag and going out to the cab that he got hit by a car or something? I, or oh what happened? God. Yeah, <laughs> hey, we were we were down there working on the third album at right. at, at one on one, and um, Johnny's girlfriend was flying in from Canada, okay. and okay. he was he was excited to see her, you know. So he split from the studio and he drove out to the airport, parked his uh -oh. car. And he's walking across from the parking garage, you know, where all the cars go by into the terminal. Right. And he comes out, and there's a bus parked there. And he walked out in front of the bus. Oh, and it's like, no. And this, this lady hits him. It was her fault, but Johnny just didn't see her. And it was just bang. And he's down on the on the side. And he broke his leg in, like, five places. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was awful. Yeah. That's right in the crazy. Middle, right vocal overdubs. He had to go oh. back home. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's a real buzzkill. And now, and then, the, and then the best part of this story, though, that it says the way it's worded, it says, and then Michael McDonald came in and, and sang some stuff, and I'm like, so like Michael McDonald from the Doobie Brothers and you know, with Steely Dan, just like suddenly came in. I just then immediately makes me want to sing every single Honeymoon Suite song in the Michael McDonald voice, which I think <laughs> adds a whole new, a whole okay. new thing to. It. How the hell did that happen? That happened because Ted Templeman was producing the album. Right. And he was like head of A&R at Warner's at the time, who we were with. So it's a long story. But anyways, he was producing the record. And we had one song, one of my songs that I just couldn't finish. We had the music done. I just couldn't get a lyric. <coughs> so Ted mm -hmm. suggested sending it out to Michael. Wow. Then at the moment, he, he came in the next day with the lyric. And he hung around and he sang background vocals on it. Wow. Amazing. That's yeah. So he wasn't like, you could tell the boss I'm at a loss, I'm looking out for number one. Because I think that would be awesome. <laughs> that sounds like Sheriff. He's rehearsing for his role. That's how I passed that audition. Exactly, yeah. I'm always, that's kind of I'm always... that, that kind of stuff happens in L.A., right? You know, everybody's right? there. Show so, up. And what was that like? I know that you're, you must... We, I've always assumed you have a, a great love for Eddie Van Halen and, and, and your guitar playing shows shades of that. So I would imagine working with someone like Ted must have been a real trip. It was. It was. Yeah. Of Such course. a legend. Yeah. 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 And, the know, guitar playing on that record is next level, brother. Great work. Yeah, oh, for sure. You. Thank you. Yeah, but just to back up, even on the, the big prize, because you guys did, was that Bruce Fairburn? That was yeah. Fairburn and uh, Bob Rock. On rock, yeah. I mean, talk about having the luxury of some great producers on some, you know. Did you, go, did you go to Vancouver to do that? Was that actually at Little Mountain? Yeah, we did. Well, Fairburn, Fairburn came in as producer. And at that point, Bob Rock, like neither of them had really blown up yet. They were on the oh. verge. Of, and Bob Rock was still his engineer at uh, Little Mountain. So we start, started the record at, at a place in uh, Long Island, some little studio that the uh, record company wants to go there. And Bob Rock gets there, and the place is a piece of shit. You know, it's like yeah. a house. Nothing's working, and he's just freaking out after a week. He says, fuck this, we're going. Oh, sorry, can I swear here? Yeah, of course sure. you can. He, he said, you know, we picked up, and we went back to Little Mountain. And we finished it there. So, I, you know, Bob was there with all his guitars and, and amps, which was a lot of fun for me and Bruce Fairburn. I mean, talk about talent, you know, talented people. It was just amazing. The word on the street was that that record opened a lot of doors for those guys. Because I know that the Bon Jovi guys got hip to that 
uh, Honeymoon Suite record. So I, from what I understand, that record really opened a lot of doors for both Bruce and then eventually Bob, obviously, as well. So, Well, I don't know about that, but the next album that, that Bruce did after us was Slippery. And yeah. you know, we all know from there, so good yeah. for him. I mean, yeah. holy shit. Yeah, uh, I know. Wow. And it's then Bob... Deep. You know, Bob started doing stuff. I think he did Kingdom Come and and Cult, and then you know, yeah, Molly, and then yeah. Matt, and then Metallica, and then it's all over after that. Yeah, yeah, off he went. Yeah, there is a lot of great stuff though on that record. Like the guitar squeals on uh, Bad Attitude are some of the best. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Such I mean, a great record. Uh, sonically, that whole record was amazing. The the clean tones, and I remember reading an article where you said that Bob had all his amps there, so he could just pick and choose whatever. You guys try to? Did you try a lot of different amps, or was it just kind of like maybe one or two, or what? How did that go? Just a, just a bit of everything. Well, he's a guitar player, as you know, Corey. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a guitar noob like us. And yeah. He would, just, he would bring his stuff in there. I'd have my stuff, and he would just keep bringing more stuff every day from his house. Let's try this amp and that amp, and you know how it goes. You just play around. Totally. Take oh. days and days, you get a tone, and, and he's just got some great stuff, like tone-wise. Yeah. And then it make it inspires you to play better and come up with more parts. I mean, you know, totally. when you're on a roll and you're inspired, just sometimes you get these happy accidents when you play stuff yeah. you didn't do before, and it's, holy shit, what was that, you know? Totally. So, Derry, that brings oh, yeah. us to a good, sorry, Are Corey, you... but I guess somebody just asked uh, following that, uh, James was asking online, is there a particular song out of your catalog that is your favorite to play? <laughs> and on top of that, do you have a favorite solo that you like to play? Oh, I like, um, I don't know. I don't know. There's uh, there's a song called uh, All Along You Knew, which is off the big prize that, that yeah. you actually play flute on. Yeah, that's so yeah. cool. I like it because it's, I think it's a shuffle, but it's it's different. It's kind of different for us. And the, the song opens with kind of like a guitar exercise that I just had. We made it into a song. So it's challenging. Yeah. I like playing that song. And there's a few solos. Now that I've had a lot of time at home to play around and do videos for my older stuff, I'm digging back into the old songs, and it's really refreshing. Go back to the old records and hear how I've been playing the solos wrong all these years. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and relearning them. And Because when you're out on the road, I don't want to listen to Honeymoon Suite, you know, because I'm just yeah. tired. Now that I've been home, there's a song called Words in the Wind that I was playing the other day. I really love the solo. In, in that one that I did and love changes everything I like that solo too totally great yeah, yeah. Did, were you very um, prepared when you went in the studio in those days or did you do a lot of stuff off the cuff or improvising in the studio or did you kind of know what you were going to do when you got into the studio I like to have things worked out ahead of time as much as possible right, right from the songwriting I like to write the song like almost to the end because I don't want to get in the studio and jam you know, yeah, right. I want to have everything mapped out as much as possible so we're not wasting any time, or at least we've got a good place to start. And then when it comes to solos, I'll go off in a room and I'll spend hours in there to kind of work out a framework again. I just don't want to come in and throw stuff off the cuff because I'm not good. I'm not good at that. I, I like to have a solo that, that sings, you know, that, that's good. So I'll spend right. six the solo and I'll come in, I'll play it for Fairburn, you won't like it, and you'll tell me to start again. So Right. <laughs> yeah. Can you do something? Have you got any other ideas? And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that actually happened to me. I was working with an artist named Carson Cole back in the eighties. And um I, we we did a song a couple uh, three songs with Bill Henderson actually. I don't know if I ever told the rest of you guys in Took. Um Bill Henderson and, from from Chilliwack. 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 And so he, he, I was already in on a little bit nervous, and I get in front of him, and I've worked out this solo, and it was exactly the same thing. He's like, "Yeah, that's great, but do you ever just like just play whatever's <laughs> off the top of your mind, and you know, you just kind of go in the moment?" And I'm like, "Oh my God, here we go." <laughs> right. Well, you should you should have just said, "Yeah, that was off the top of my head." Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's frustrating being a guitar player, but you know you have to be able to, to think on your feet too, and you yeah. have to be able to improvise. And sometimes, having said what I just said about working stuff out, other times I've come in and just played some crap off the cuff, and they love it, and it's full right. of mistakes and, and sloppiness, <laughs> but it's got feel, and they go, no, that's it. 
keep that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 The guitar is weird, you know? Vocals are like that, too, though. Like, a lot of the times, people can overthink singing something so that the 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 notes are all perfect and, you know, all that kind of stuff, and the timing's all perfect, but it kind of, you kind of lost some of the, you know, the, 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 that the humanness of it all. And that, yeah. that goes for probably every instrument, I suppose, you know, yeah. just, True. you know, True. so, it, so is that, is that, is that tire track uh, guitar that you've been playing the original tire track guitar that you've always been playing? Um, oh, it's right. Is it there? Yeah. Let's see. Cool. Oh. Okay. No way. Wow. All right. It was. It's a Kramer. Originally yeah. Originally Kramer, but the the first uh, headstock got broken. Oh. Put, put it oh. Oh. Okay. Cool. What year is that? And then I have another one right here. What year is that, Gary? Oh um, yeah. Whoa. Like 1986, 85. Oh, wow. 86. Back wow. in the day when, you know, we all used to get tons of free shit and Kramer was saying cars <laughs> and Hamer and everything else back in the old days. But anyways, that, that one's been around since 86 or 87. It's kind of a very signature looking guitar for you. Like, it's always the one I think of whenever I... So I saw a picture of you recently. I said, oh, is that the same guitar? That's so it cool. Is. That's it so is. cool. Hey, Derry, I think I saw you guys, was it with Helix? Maybe, um, did you guys tour together in like 86 or something like yeah. that? Yeah, we did. Okay, so I saw that tour, but what record was that on again um, for you guys? 86? Yeah. Uh, Might have been the big prize. Big prize. prize. The no, I, th I think it was on your, like, I remember. Racing here, After Mid, maybe the no, third album? No, that wasn't out yet. But I definitely saw you guys at like Winnipeg Arena. Well, it might have been the first album then or... or it was definitely an arena tour. 86. Yeah. We did arenas on the first tour eventually. Okay. Wow. And I remember touring with Helix, so it could have been. Yeah. Anyway. But I, um, I should mention this guitar, just put a shameless plug in. You, yeah. you guys, you're familiar with Godin guitars, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Them. So they're doing a signature model for me now. Cool. Which is really cool. I've been talking to them for a while. So they're going to do a Godan uh, tire tread model. Nice. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. I'll get one. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> so Hell yeah. Excited. We'll see. It's going to be a while yet. but um, yeah. So Derry, uh, again, so cool. going back to some of our live feed and, and your comments about liking to go, you know, going in prepared. Um, has the pandemic and all your time at home given you a chance to write new material? Can we expect any new material coming up soon new record single yeah yeah we're we're way into to a new album do any of you guys know a guy named mike crumpus i know the name mike, mike he's a he's a he's a toronto guy but he's lived in la and nashville and he's he's a producer a wicked guitar player and he's right. played with Ash Mouth and Nelly Furtado, and he's just done a lot of stuff. Super talented guy. Anyways, right, right. I hooked up with, we hooked up with Mike a couple years back, and um, he's producing our new record. So we started recording in his place in Nashville like last year, and now he's moved to, to the UK, and we're about probably 80% of the way. There's a new album, and we're working on it now. That's fantastic. Yeah. Are you able to chip away at any of that? Currently, like in in like remotely from uh, via the internet somehow, or you got to kind of wait till this all passes to no. finish it up. This is the beauty of of you know the state of recording these days. The upside of it is that we can do we can send tracks around, which we never used to be able to do, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Johnny and I have been over, gone over to his place in England in December and January a few times doing overdubs, but since this virus hit. Um, that's what I was doing right before you guys called me today. I'm doing guitar nice. tracks at home. Nice. Wow. Cool. I'm doing my solos and my vocals and my keyboards, and I'm going to send them back to Mike. Like, awesome. So what do you use for an app when you're recording at home? Do you do, you do a digital? Um, digital. Well, I'm, I'm working in Logic, so I'm just doing whatever you know amp is in there because Mike is – I'm going to send him a clean track, and he's going to reamp oh, yeah. it. Okay. Right. That's sure, cool. Yeah. 
he's pretty particular. And talk about a, a guitar new Corey, you'd love this guy. You go to the studio. He's got tons of stuff. And he, he plays these iconic guitars, which are really nice. And uh, he's got wicked guitar sounds. I, I really like working with him. Fun That's fun. so awesome. So he, yeah. he's, he's really good on, on guitar sounds. I'm amazing. Yeah. Awesome. Fantastic. Did you graduate from uh, like a, a college studying music production? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Fanshawe. Ban cool. Fanshawe. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Ah. Yeah. Any of you guys ever go there? Probably not. No. no. I haven't been there, but what it's year, interesting what that year you did you graduate that, Fanshawe? You know, after the step. Oh, like <laughs> 1925. Like a long time ago, man. like 1980, early 80s, late 79 or 80. It was a long time ago. But that, um, it was really, you know, at that time, it, it got me out of, you know, St. Catharines and got me into college. And, and I learned uh, my way around the studio back when it was like one inch tape and an eight track and tutor machines and stuff. But it taught me how to record. And uh, I wrote New Girl now when nice. I was at, at that at college. Yeah, oh, my, wow. bro so, my brother's cool. a Fanshawe wow. graduate, and, I understand, like, and then there's a couple of other Canadian guys. Harry Hess, Harem Scarum was a Fanshawe graduate as well. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. There there's been a few good people that have come out of there and have, have gone on, you know, to, to you know, careers in the music business. So it, it did good for me because after there, I moved up to Toronto and eventually got, you know, years later with met Johnny and got in hunting the sweets so it's like one thing leads to another you know yeah it really does so when you guys won the contest yeah. was awesome. it, did you go in with Everybody just a in. single or did you have enough material to record an album so when that came were you guys make ready to make the transition from a cover band to a, a full-on original project at that point pretty much i've been writing stuff on the road because we were looking at when we demoed new girl now we did uh, three other songs that ended up on the first album because when we were on the road, we were, you know, we were a cover band, but as far as Johnny and I were concerned, we're going to take, you know, we're going to get out of this cover band hell, and we're going to get a deal, and we're going to uh, hopefully, you know, do an album, which eventually happened. So I was writing a lot, and we were rehearsing and kind of sneaking the songs into the show, but not telling anybody, and uh, they kind of went over. So That's awesome. We got signed. I had enough songs for an album or else I had to write a few more but it was pretty fast I that's think you so need to uh, collaborate with Tuke of course well, that's a good idea I'd love to work with you guys of course that would be awesome mm -hmm. yeah because I was well, just about to ask you for advice on because we're starting to write more originals now and, and go that direction we're, we're like Honeymoon Suite was you know transitioning from the cover band so oh, really? the band. Uh, yeah I don't know if you've heard our first single but it um, you know, it's it's ignited that creative spirit in us to you know Has go it? on and do some more stuff like that. Yeah, I saw you. I saw a video. Did you do a video for it? Yes, yes. we did. Yeah, we did. Okay, well that that makes me happy because you guys definitely should go more original. If you're if you're starting to write songs, man, let's talk later and let's we can Skype right Skype or something. Skype There you go. I'd love That's to work term, with you. Yeah. Well. Skype right. Skype right, whatever. <laughs> which which kind of, it's it's okay. Like my daughter's been doing it since she's been home, but if there's no substitute for being in the same room, yeah, right. In this day and age, well, we'll Skype right for for now. It gets it done. Yeah, for sure. Now that's a good segue to Leah because um, when I met you in Chicago at the Shania concert, um, I took you backstage and you brought your your family with you. And Leah is your daughter, and she's an artist in her own right and fantastic. She plays guitar, and she sings really well, and she's also a goalie in hockey. That's no so way. crazy. Wow. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about her? Yeah, she was. Well, she played when, when she was playing. She hasn't played in a while because she aged out, and she also got a couple of concussions. Oh. Hit in the head with pucks, so we, that messed her up. So we pulled her out of hockey you know, after that point. But it, at that point, she was a, a goalie on a double-A boys team. Well, so, don't be a goalie wow. if you don't want to get yeah, hit by yeah. the Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's tough. I mean, she, she can take the hits. I mean, she's not a weeping willow. She's she's tough, and she didn't mind getting hit with the pucks. But, you know, after concussions, that's it. So no. This would have been you a know, good segue to bring the, yeah. uh, the goalies to um, guitar on. 
it's all taken apart. I'm doing a custom paint job on it right now. So. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for yeah. sure. You got to bring that out next week. Yeah. Exactly. So is so, Leah, is she in uh, shouting range there to make a cameo appearance here? She went out to see her friends. If she shows up, I'll, I went upstairs to look for her, but she, she went oh, out okay. for a little bit. But oh, here's where we get all the comments. She missed her big not chance. Distancing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, that was that was a real thrill for her, and thanks for having this up. And, no problem. And, man, Shania, like, what a show, and she's so good. And, and, and I just, you know. I never get over. I, I still. I've been doing this so long. But I still love going to concerts, big concerts, and and see all that stuff. It was so good, so slick, and she oh, yeah. she had a real thrill, you know, in the backstage and, and everything. So um, I'm glad she stopped playing hockey because she concentrated more on on music and writing. Mm-hmm. And she's been, she's at Belmont, in Nashville now, doing songwriting. Oh, so good for her. Gonna, She's in a great place, and she's doing a lot of networking and songwriting, and kind of just doing the thing. So, we'll see what happens. That's and great. As you get Fantastic. more involved in speaking wow. of All big the best shows, to her. That's and great. of course, yeah. you know the '80s. You know, bigger was better. Uh, somebody's asking, um, and some people may or may not even know, getting songs on big shows like Miami Vice, and of course, movies like Lethal Weapon. Um, how did that come about and did that Lethal Weapon 2. was that did they approach you for that uh, john is asking uh, how that went about and uh, how did that affect your career from that point on well it doesn't hurt and, and pr- pretty much that at the back in the day in the mid and late 80s we were on um warner brothers in la so they're all tied in with the you know the movie lot down there and the publisher and those things just kind of came our way. We had a good manager. And the Miami Vice thing, I guess that came through publishing. Somebody seeking, you know, Miami Vice was using a lot of 80s bands and songs. Yeah. And I don't know exactly yeah. how it happened, but I'm glad that it did. And they ended up using like three or four of our songs in different episodes. The Weapon Woman, because um, we were writing for the third album. Bruce Fairburn couldn't do it because he was off in Bon Jovi land and we were looking for a producer. So uh, Lethal Weapon, the first movie was just about to come out and some, and they were all saying it's a good movie, it's gonna be a big movie, but they hadn't had the title track cut yet. So we were in the studio with Ted doing some pre-production down there and they sent over uh, a cassette of it. A guy named Michael Kamen wrote the song, we didn't. So it was just a, like, like a vocal piano demo and Johnny heard it and goes, this, I, can't, I can't sing this. But Ted encouraged them to kind of take another listen, and we just cut it in in the studio we're already set up. So that's how that happened. It just came by the studio one day, and it was one of those. By the way, Johnny, there's a, mo- a song for a movie you guys want to take a run at, and that's, that's so happened. cool. Wow. Yeah, I remember yeah. seeing that movie and going, "Is that Honeymoon Sweet?" Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, you know, when when things are happening, when a lot of things are going on, and you've got a deal, and and this is happening, things kind of opportunities just kind of come your really way is, no and you just you say like, okay all right that sounds yeah. good you know absolutely and, and to touch on something that i saw recently as well and of course somebody is asking the same thing you posted something recently about a tour you did back with heart back in the late 80s and you had a whole truck if i'm not mistaken or just all of your guitars somehow all of your gear went missing did you ever manage to recover oh, any of that? no Wow, they, that's the worst. That's happened to me. Took, it's the worst. They took the truck. It was a. It was like one of those big rider trucks, and we were supporting oh Hart. And the crew was at a motel in New Jersey, the night before, and they parked the truck at the motel. We think it was an inside job, but they got up in the morning. It was a rider truck, and apparently they weren't too hard to steal. You could start it up and drive it away. But they got up in the morning, and the truck was gone. Everything. Oh, Every couple weeks after wow. that, new upcoming band, Inside Job, took off. You know. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> good band, good band. Yeah, well, that, Inside yeah. job. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Right down. We played that. We played that night. I mean, everybody pulled together, and the other band helped us out and got us some gear. Fortunately, we were close close enough to New York that they went in and just got amps and guitars and everything else. But the thing is, I had with me, um, um, and Corey can relate to this. I had a '68 SG that I bought when I was a kid, like a teenager, and that was my baby. 
and I'd had that a long time with sentimental, but that got taken, and that's the one. Oh that my smokes. god, uh, that sucks. That's that yeah, always we sucks. Have, We've all got that story, right? Well, yeah. it, it may yeah. be a long shot. Yeah. We'll share that post to the uh, the Tuke page in hopes that maybe somebody will see something coming down the wire. So. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be exciting? Every once in a while, like, I posted a picture the other day. Every every little once in a while, I post a picture of all the guitars because you never know. I actually, you never know. Stranger, stranger things have happened. That, well, I had a guitar that was stolen once in Ohio, and six months later, I got it back. Wow. Wow. And then it got stolen again. Oh, oh no! Jeez, there Jeez. You go. but I mean, not meant to have it. We've all got those stories, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh well, there's absolutely. lots of guitars. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. There's <laughs> lots of guitars out there. <laughs> just don't take your, um, you know, just don't take your favorite ones. Like I've got an old Les Paul that I won't take out in the road because it's no. just right for me. I but don't the imagine. Other, they can be replaced. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's totally yeah. true. Yeah. There was a time when uh, we were play, playing in, in uh, White Rock, which is outside of Vancouver. So we had to drive from Vancouver to White Rock. And on the way there, we on the highway, we, we got a flat tire. And it was on the trailer. We, we had a, a cube van. We pulled a trailer. And in order to get, I don't know, some tools or the spare, the spare tire out, we had to take some gear out and put it in the ditch. And oh, no. and I forgot to put my guitar back in. Oh we got, no! We got oh, to no. the gig, and um, I'm like, "Where's my guitar? Oh shit! It's it's in the ditch." Oh <laughs> so, no! Oh, I drove back and and it was there still. So I, I, I just like <laughs> oh, got it wow. back. <laughs> Lucky, like, was wow. it just that cold out? Was that, or you just <laughs> hurried to get back in, or did you just? No, just just you know, absent-minded. Mm. That's me. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. No. It happens. Did you guys ever hear the story of Peter Frampton's Les Paul? No. I yeah. saw something online about that. That's so yeah. crazy, right? Just the, there's a whole YouTube on it. What a mm -hmm. story. Black Les Paul with the three pickups. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The thing was in a plane crash and it got burnt. Anyways, check it out sometime. It's a crazy story, but he got it. Yeah, it, it got burnt and, and they thought it was gone. So they didn't bother like, yeah. like trying to find it. And then it turned out it wasn't destroyed, and somebody got a hold of it, and it it it, had, it has a whole journey, and it ends up back in Peter Frampton's hands, like exactly. like a long time later. It's yeah. pretty fascinating, yeah. Same thing happened to Miles Goodwin from April Wine. Apparently, he got a guitar back after like thirty years. Somebody. Wow! Oh, hey. I have a bunch of stories like that. My brothers had two guitars stolen and got them both back, and I'm like, you got like a horseshoe or something, because there's no way that ever happens. Yeah. People's well, guitars get stolen, they're gone, you know. Okay, well, like in New Jersey, they took, I probably had eight or nine guitars, okay? Ouch. What are they going to do? What are they going to do with them? You know? I know. I mean, what do yeah. you do? They're like sitting under some kid's bed somewhere. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. The only stories that are sadder than that are the guys who's like, you know, they get divorced and the, and the ex-wife just sells off his guitars. <laughs> and you're always like, oh, <laughs> that hurts. It happens, yeah. though. Yeah. yeah, I know. They're out there. It's somewhere. memories. They're telling they're stories. Somewhere. They're telling stories yeah, somewhere somebody, else. Hopefully, somebody's making magic with that guitar somewhere. You know, you never know. You never know. Exactly. You never know. No, that's fantastic. As long as somebody's playing. Yeah. Shane, you're pretty quiet up there. Well, I hope I get my I, Ivan as Iceman back because I had that stolen in like 1986. We just oh like to God. really quick. We'd like to really quickly point out that Shane Gallus is our, is a has been a, a, a dairy uh, impressionist. Uh, he's been a. <laughs> we could pretty much hire him for a guitar player in a, in a honeymoon yeah. suite. Speaking of something band. that's gone missing for thirty years and now reunited, <laughs> oh, yeah. these guys were separated I, at birth. Yeah, exactly. Separated uh, I, birth. I've been hearing that almost since I met Corey. I think he's been telling me that we look yeah. alike. So. I tell him he looks like Gary looks Grand from Honeymoon Suite and Luke Skywalker from. Uh, the original Star Wars. Star Wars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a much better looking younger version. Uh, than I think the contrary. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. contrary. They even <laughs> part their hair to the same side. <laughs> so, what are, I guess we touched on this earlier. I guess you guys are just like sitting in idle waiting for something to happen. I guess everybody's just at home playing, doing stuff, and not really going anywhere, right? 
I don't know. I li- like I, I've been saying, I literally sit here every week staring at a blank screen for seven days until these guys magically appear on the screen and start talking to me. And then I just, oh, here we go. Let's do this. Yeah. Derek Rehan's here. Let's, let's do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I was thinking the other day, I was talking to somebody. Fortunately, we're, we're musicians, and we've got a great way to kill time. Like, I can sit in my studio. I can sit here for hours and hours, just noodle and play. It seems yes. I never run out things to do when you're writing and playing and goofing around. Whereas exactly. if I wasn't in prison, I, I can only watch so much Netflix, you know? Exactly, you yeah. You know? Well, no. If you That's guys what... uh, get the Skype writer going and you get this material, uh, Gloria actually has a really great name, and she says, how about calling the band Took Sweet? Which, <laughs> which is pretty good. That's pretty good. I like it. I like it. What does that? So what what does that mean in in French? Too sweet. Toot, toot sweet yeah, like, immediately. Toot sweet, like right now. Toot sweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's funny. So what is like... going on with you guys now? Are you writing? Did you do? Have you just put a couple singles out in a video, or you got an album, or what's going on? We have two records. Uh, the first one's called Giver. That's what yeah. uh, New Girl now is on. That's uh, right. The cover. Stuff. And then we did a follow up to that called Never Enough, which has the title track. Uh, which is our first original song, which is ne- that's the one you saw in the video, Never Enough for You. Um, and so now, you know, what's next for Took? Well, I guess we'll wait and see, but uh, we're we're writing, you know, it, right right now is the perfect time for us to be writing, and we have been, you know, over Skype. We've been doing Skype writes, uh, and it's it's going pretty good. Yeah. So, yeah. Where, where do you guys record your albums? Is it a, you just all kind of sending files around or do you actually get right there in Corey's house and... yeah. right That's behind Corey's me house generally yeah yeah, yeah. Corey, Corey are, I'm sorry are you in Vegas or, or uh, LA LA yeah LA okay yeah yeah because when we when we met at the uh at the Shania you were telling me that you got a place I guess that's your room there I see a bunch of guitars like you got the whole setup yep. going right it's a great little tracking room I could do drums but it's not really big enough for drums mostly just overdubs I got a vocal booth that I can put amps in and stick mm-hmm. a singer in there. And then I mix everything. I got a nice little mix set up right here. And that's yeah, kind of Shane's, Shane's got a whole set up at his place that's where the drums get done. So Shane also has a, his own studio setup, which is uh, it's mostly for pornography, but he also makes music. I <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> because we all know sound yeah, is actually, the most should... important thing in porno. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Pay the bills. Yeah, yeah exactly. Music- yeah, Shane's got a great tracking room for drums, so all the drums get done at his his stuff. Although in the oh. first album, they, we did them at my brother's studio in Vegas. That was before Shane was in the mix, but now that Shane is here, uh, he's very <laughs> self sufficient and uh, very. In fact, we the first time the first day that we ever met, we were in his studio mixing some stuff uh, that of his solo records that he was doing. Cool. That's right. Yeah. Everybody got a studio. Everybody got a yeah, studio. Especially nowadays, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well. Uh, Again, you don't need much, do you? I mean, I don't. I'm not a studio guy or a mixer, but I've got enough that I just I've got Logic and I've got a few guitars, and it you know it's good for writing and yeah, I, you know, get it done. I get my ideas down. I'm happy with that. Absolutely, yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Well, Derry, we want to thank you so much for coming on the show. And uh, anybody else have Thank any other so questions much. before we uh, we segue into our next half of the show here? Uh, well, we, we might be making some uh, changes in the guitar player department, Derry, so stick around. Yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> Don't go nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, kidding, and, of course, Corey. everybody keep an okay. eye out. Uh, you know, when things do get back to normal, uh, keep an eye for these guys on tour. We want to thank you for stopping by and hanging with us for a little bit. Thank you, Derry. Thanks, Derry. You're awesome, Thanks, man. Derry. Great, Thanks, to you. Great, to Great to meet you. Thanks, bye. He's cool.
All right. Woohoo. Everyone in position. <clears throat> Everyone have a pee? Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> it's very necessary. So we got guest number two. Mm. Number two. All right. Brent, guess why don't you uh, why don't you introduce him? Where is uh, where is guest number two? I'm right he's here. He's coming. Oh, hey. He's going to get a guitar. I like that. He's also uh, is uh, so what's oh, awesome? Our is, second guest uh, is uh, our second guest is actually well, he's she's just down the street from Todd, which is ten minutes from me that's in right, Vegas, actually. Oh. and uh, <laughs> another fellow Canadian, and uh, and another another Ontario guy. So Derry from Ontario. Originally, and then the legendary Jason Hook. Can you guys see me? I can't see you. I can't see you. I can't see me. I can only see you guys. Really? Where are you? You're looking. Really? You're looking sexy. How does it work? Hold on, let me tap on some stuff here. Tap on some Tap, tap, tap. What are you playing for us today? You playing for playing some for us? <laughs> my security. It's like more of a security blanket than anything else. Oh, okay. Where is that? I get fidgety. Oh, this is uh, Yamaha. Ah, nice. That's oh, nice. nice. I, um, I have. Uh, I have almost as many. Well, I shouldn't say that, but I have a pretty good collection of acoustics because I just love playing acoustic guitar. That's amazing. Is that your oh. studio there, Jason? Is that have you got like a home studio going on in there as well? Oh, you know I do. <laughs> Who doesn't anymore, right? I mean, but is it anything like Shane Gallus's Pornhub? I don't know. <laughs> no, no, he's he's got us all Trump. I mean, I, I, um, he's got the, he's got the square footage. He does indeed. He's got the yeah. Well, we footage. know Simi Valley or the Valley in general is the porn capital of. What did you call it? Semen uh, Valley. <laughs> Great. Simi. Oh, oh no, <laughs> the San Fernando Valley. Wow, not San Fernando. Yeah, you know what? Remember. I got to say, I've been to Jason's house, and that studio there is really, really inspiring. You did a yeah. good job, my friend. Yeah. Thanks. I, um, you know, uh, I figured there's there's wants, needs, and tools, and so I always directed my my earnings towards tools, and kind of left the wants. Like there was a, you know, like. Some kind of uh, Egyptian cotton throw rug that was fourteen thousand dollars. That's a walk. That's a walk. Yeah, that's I don't even want that. I'm just that's a terrible example. But that would be like yeah. way down on the list. Yeah. I was like, tools are a good way to learn, and uh, you know you can make products with tools. That's true. That's true. You know what's cool, Jason? Uh, what's you that? and Corey are probably the most prolific, um, you know, studio cats that I know. But you also are like computer wise i remember when so you and i go way back you know when we played in a lot of bands together but the first yeah. time i came over to your house you had a whole really killer computer setup and you were doing like some graphic stuff and like you've always been good with you know technology and and uh embraced that well thank you it's it's i always just you know the more uh skill set you have the the less you need to rely on other people right so, um, you know, I was doing websites in the early 2000s. I taught myself how to do websites. Um, well, I, did, I had a guy that was much better than me, and he showed me, he fast-tracked me to learn how to do websites. And then I started um, selling websites to people and running their websites and hosting no money their websites. That. And I, I was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not now, but... There was back then, fun. yeah. In the dot com boom, um, I was the go to guy. I was working for uh, I had su surgeons and real estate guys, and I mean, I was doing corporate websites um, out of my apartment. And uh, what I realized is that I had every little thing they wanted to change. Hey, I, can you make this blue today? And I have a brand new photograph I'd like to update. And then you start to realize that these guys are. Uh, powerless over their own business website because they have to rely on somebody else. Can you guys and, relate to that at all? And <laughs> so I've always just been. <laughs> <laughs> Darren's saying that because he does all of our web stuff. Well, I, exactly. you know, all of it. 
it's it's an arduous, thankless task. I mean, doing the website, especially now with the way social media kind of took over, where you don't really need to have your own website anymore. Okay, that's enough with Jason um, today. Uh, it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, buddy. Thanks for coming on. Well, trust me. I mean, I have I have a few of my own websites, but it's like it's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. When did so, you guys meet? Like, when was this era? Brent uh, Fitz and I. Yeah. Did you guys meet in America or in Canada? Did you guys know yeah. each other from Canada? Yeah, so no. I didn't know Jason as on the Canadian bar circuit because you were mostly in Ontario, right, touring? And oh. I was mostly on the West Coast. So coast to we coast. kind of we, really? we um, bumped into each other in Los Angeles. I met yeah. all, my, all my cool Canadian friends I met in America. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? Uh, well, you know why? Because a lot of Canadians would move to Los Angeles, so there was a pool, yeah. but yeah. and in and, and Vegas, in mm -hmm. fact. But in mm -hmm. Canada, you would never meet other Canadians unless they were in your town, because you uh, never. Yeah. I never traveled. I did travel, but I didn't make friends in Canada. I was just playing bars that had strip clubs at night. What <laughs> 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 so band was it that would have taken you west? Like back in the late eighties. Well, when well, I was in I, when I was in Canada, I had an original band that worked really hard. We eventually got signed to Electra Records, and we were we spent three or four months in Los Angeles making a record with Bo Hill. And as soon as we turned in the record, uh, we got dropped. So you can only imagine how that I felt. Love that. Yeah, I love that. Mm, thanks for your thanks for the hard work. Um, is that and what so, brought you to Los Angeles in the first place? We were that? talking about this earlier. Is that how you ended up going to Los Angeles in the first place? Did that, that bring you to Los Angeles? That was my very first experience in Los Angeles. And I just, I felt the energy there. And I felt the tremendous amount of activity as far as yeah. the entertainment hub of the mm -hmm. country, you know. And kind of the world, too. I mean, Los Angeles, right? Right. So um, I just w when things went sideways with that record deal and that band and all that, I thought I just got to figure out how to get back to Los Angeles. I don't know anybody there. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get there. But it's a lot. I, I, I think that that's a that I everyone. If I stay in Canada now as a dropped artist. Right. I, I'm going to end up playing Jack Sugar Shack, uh, <laughs> you know, or um, right, brown eyed girl. Or, or like working in a warehouse or something. I mean, I couldn't stomach the thought. So I thought, you know, having had seen Los Angeles and, and what was going on there, I said, I just got to get back there right away. Mm -hmm. So I literally pa I packed up my Dodge Colt, had 200 bucks, and I just beeline for L.A. with wow. no wow. plan. <laughs> wow. Did you have a visa or, or are you just? No, I, of course I not. stuck into the country. Yeah. I have a passport now, so I can say <laughs> I stuck into the country. <laughs> <laughs> But my my dear old dad, uh, he had, you know, my dad's this old guy. He had his car was loaded up with my Marshall and my guitars and 412 and the whole thing in the trunk. <laughs> and as soon as, like, I went across the border, like, this rock and roll guy, right? And they're kind of like, where are you going? I'm going shopping. I'm just going to go buy some records, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they looked at me and they kind of asked me a bunch of questions. Then they let me through. And then my dad, he's like, I'm going to buy cigars at the, you know, right. half price. So <laughs> they let him in. So we then we met down the street, a mile down the street. We pulled into a gas station, put all my gear into my Dodge Colt. Ah. And I just I gave him a hug. I said, okay, I'll call you when I get there. <laughs> wow. See ya. Wow. That is genius. Hard. I think a lot of us have that story, though. It's like the border is kind of scary and daunting. But, well, you know, I got blocked. got to get creative. They caught me going. I tried to fly to LA originally, yeah. Um, and they and I was young and naive, and they asked me all these questions. Well, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do there? Well, I'm going to, down there to make it. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever worked in the states before? And I got well because we had the band signed to Electra, we had done gigs and showcase. So oh. I said. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. No, I've played shows. Red and flag. Stuff. Red flag. Yeah, and they're like, okay, uh -oh. cool. Here's go into this room over here, get gloves searched <laughs> by fucking Doc Super Lube, and uh, they put a huge X on my plane ticket, and then oh, there was there was no, and then my name was in the computer, and there was no getting 
I could not fly there. But it worked out better because dry, e- even though the drive there was, it, it took three or four days, uh, I had a car there, which was good. Yeah. yeah. But what yeah. happened if you ever had to come back? Like, I'm sure at some point you had to go back and then. Well, I didn't go back. I didn't go, I didn't mess with that again for a very long time. But what, what I did do, and uh, what I did do right away is I, um, I, were, I got my O one one visa, which I think is a three year visa. It cost a couple grand. I had a producer friend of mine that sponsored me. I started okay. working with this producer, Bo Hill. Right. Right. And, uh, he was gracious enough to fill out all the paperwork and say, Jason will be working for me as a studio cat. Right. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to employ him under my company, blah, 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 which was all yeah, bullshit. O one. So that's, yeah, and then I uh, got the lawyer involved, and then we got the O one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think we're all unanimous. Process. We've all dealt with the O one, right, guys? Yeah. Oh, the dread. Well, because it's it was two or three thousand bucks, and it was good every. It was only good for three years. So three every years. time that came up, you're like, oh man, yeah. I got paid this money all over again. Crap. You yeah. know. My- Mine was about to expire like in two months from the date that I was going back into the States. And they said, no, you're not coming through because your visa is going to expire in two months. I'm like, well, it's two months. I'll have my two months. Still, right. Still I good, have, right? Like, sorry. I ended up staying for two months. It took me two months at the dead of winter back in Innisfail, Alberta. Meanwhile, my whole life was down here. I had my bands and I was working and my drums and. Yeah. I'd already graduated school, and I had all these visas in the works, and producers, you know, hiring me for stuff. But I couldn't come back. I had to stay in Innisfail. Well, I did. I did come. I did come back at one point and did a Killer Dwarves tour. Oh wow! Uh, well, I'll take I'll take oh, things I'll, that are I'll, not on my resume for four hundred. <laughs> 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 wait, wait, wait! Just to back up, you just defended yes. poor Darren again. He loves the killer dwarfs. Well, so do I. But we all yeah, that, we all love the dwarfs. It, you have to be Canadian to appreciate that. Well, or course, hearing it yeah, here yeah. live on TikTok. Um, now we're ready to go check it out. Yeah, yeah check it out, out killer dwarfs. Check it out, eh? just said out. Jason, we uh, we can't not admit that you and I both were bullet boys together. Yeah, we were. That's how we met. But man, uh, or is that some sort of sex group I don't know about? Or yeah, no, right. Uh, <laughs> well, the most important was we actually recorded with Andy Johns together. And we kind of cool. sealed our friendship by actually going in the studio together. And we worked with one of the greatest, you know, rock producers that did so many great records, Led Absolutely. Zeppelin. But Rolling Stone. He also Van did Halen. the Killer Dwarfs. Oh, my God. He yeah. did do Killer Dwarfs. So he did it's like Weapons. This- Oh it is. The, it, it's like a, everyone is connected in some way. If we did like a, a flow chart, <laughs> well, I mean, it would go, it would go on for miles. Um, <laughs> but, but degrees of separation you know for the killer dwarfs. Yeah. Actually, yeah. if you really think about that, because poor Andy Johns died. He was a t- terrible, had a terrible alcohol problem. And uh, but um, but I mean, talk. Ta- that was probably the coolest thing that came out of my experience in Bullet Boys was working with Andy Johns because, in retrospect, he's kind of ledge, you know, and yeah. worked did the Van Halen stuff. So you know, I had a billion questions about how that went down. And absolutely, and yeah. and Andy and I used to go. We were I can't remember Cherokee Studios in Hollywood. Yeah, we did some of the tracking there, and so a- after the session, Andy and I would skip across the street to, to the bar and just sit there and tell story i'd hear stories about zeppelin and van halen for hours while he got sloshed <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then he would drive home Ew. which okay. reminds me just just a quick little insert i'm, I'm almost finished reading ted templeman's new book right highly, uh, highly recommended really I'm dying huh. to read that. Yeah. Yeah. and he did not uh, he had to come in and finish the F, uh, the uh, Cardinal Knowledge record, I think. Oh, really? Because they just could they were just all, they were all messed up and they couldn't get organized. Right. So, uh, so Andy was very abusive towards Ted, but it's a great book. I highly recommend it. I had so many things that Ted did that I had no idea about. Mm, uh, wow. All the Doobie Brothers records and uh, sure. Van Morrison. It's really a great book. Highly recommended. Is Boy, that cool Ted's voice? Is that Ted's voice, voice on, uh, on the, uh, you know, you get some leg tonight for sure. Is that Ted's yes, voice? Yes, it is. 
Come on, really? Dave, give me a that, break. That is. There's a story about that. He he had a a high profile executive. I mean, you know, he was a like senior executive. Uh, Warner Brothers at, for Warner Brothers at yeah. the, on the staff, right? So he was like right. senior vice president or something like that. So he had an important meeting to go to with Mo Austin and all these heavy cats from the label right after the session. So he came all dressed up in his business attire, and the guys in Van Halen would couldn't lay off all the jokes <laughs> and, the, and the criticism yeah. and the sarcasm. So like, nice suit, you're gonna get some leg tonight. So that was all real. <laughs> Wow. I also found out from that book, I know that I'm straying off the Canadian topic here, but the beginning of um, Hot for Teacher, the, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's actually, you, if you go back and listen to it, that's them that miking up the tailpipe of Eddie's new Lamborghini. Oh, wow. It's really? not kick drums. You can, really? And then when, if you go back and listen to it, it's crystal clear that that's not a drum kit. Because the drums start coming in after that. Doom, 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 ah. So that, that, but that's the Lamborghini. You know what I always thought it was? It was triggered those Simmons pads. Yeah, that's what, yeah, it's not. It's too dumb. random. And I, well, I figured out a way to kind of do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so did he. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, right. But he, yeah, right. that's what he did later. But that's amazing. Wait, go right. back and listen to it after this, and you'll go, wow, that's a car. But, 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 so I many. Don't. So many kids cried themselves to sleep because they couldn't play that. If only they had yeah, a Lamborghini. No, no, it's it's totally random when you... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when did the drums kick in on the... Ga, ga, ga. No, it just comes in with toms. It goes... Dum, 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 okay. Dum, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a ride and a tom. And then then it starts to switch into drums. <laughs> okay. It'll be... It'll, it's crystal. Once you hear it, you go, that's exactly what that is. There's no way that's a kick drum. Wow, so that's oh. in the book? That's Fitzy, uh, it's Gary from Thunder yeah. Bay, uh, give him a plug here, Comics Plus, um, who, I, who I've oh, personally that, delivered like, the two series to, and uh, he can remember that. He's, uh, he's laughing at the time that you brought Jason over and you guys were uh, admiring his 79 Paul Stanley Iceman. Uh, when, would, when would that have been? When would that have been? <laughs> uh, yeah. We came through... Okay, so Gary has an amazing comic store in thunder bay we have to plug comics plus and he's got such a great kiss collection as well and yeah i think he had an iceman that we checked out and jason we were with vince neal i would assume we came through thunder bay oh yeah, yeah. i remember that we went to somebody's basement or something that was gary okay <laughs> you know yeah. gary from thunder bay and um, i thought there, there's no way there's anyone who's more obsessed about kiss than i am and then it's like okay there is <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. always is brother there always yeah the, the comic book store is uh, just the front well, that's the you guys should point that out though yeah exactly you guys you have an iceman now you guys have played with you guys have played together in in vince neal uh, i think you did a quick stint in alice cooper together but you guys have played together in a bunch of stuff yeah we have well uh well what's cool is, boy, you know, vince neal and alice cooper um I've, Brent has always been very good at helping me out. I have, uh, he would always scoop me up. Yeah. Save me, but there save is something bacon. to be said for the, the Canadian gravitational pull of kind of yeah. knowing your own and our work ethic and just knowing that the path well traveled. Like when you said your story about your dad helping you out crossing the border, like I can relate. Everybody that's, yeah. you know, in Tuk Tok, right now, we all kind of, you know, it's, it's never an easy. Uh, path traveled like Todd and I have, have uh, you know been blessed we've we've kind of said to ourselves hey it's you know it's great that we've played together in the same band for over a decade now but our path coming from the prairies making it down to LA was not the same path that you know and playing in a band with like Slash who you know even though he was uh, he was born in like the UK but like you know he kind of grew up mostly in LA and Corey you're from Moose Jaw and that's pretty small and Shane, you're from an even smaller place. So, like, to come from, you know, these little towns and then, so, because I knew you were from Ontario and we, you know, we liked to kiss. It's oh, kind of easy. It's perfect. <laughs> it's I easy. Move. Wait, you like I to kiss? Geek your, uh, Fitz asked me to help him move. He had to get out of his apartment. So they found him, they bought a place. And then I was, like, the only guy that showed up to help in the rain. Wow. Geek all of your furniture. <laughs> wow. You know what? That's that's important. You know what? Find who your real friends are. When you need to move, 
And everybody's <laughs> yeah. like, oh, man, that, today I'm busy. Test, Jason yeah. showed up with headband on, ready to <laughs> help me move the damn fridge. To, like, I'll never yeah. forget that, buddy. That's, that's a friend, fridge. man. That's a friend. Well, I'm well, glad I have you guys because I... You guys should all come over this weekend. I got to move some stuff. So uh, yeah. <laughs> what year was that, Fitz? Oh gosh, well, two thousand three. So you know, it's funny when we look back, Jason, because you and I do not live in LA anymore, and we both have been in Vegas for a, a long time. But at one yeah, time, how long have you been in Vegas, Jason? I was trying to figure this out. I I moved out here in two thousand eleven. Oh, that long? Eleven. Yeah. Wow. So almost. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. It's a great yeah. town, though, right? I love Vegas. Yeah, I, it, it's it's fantastic because you know L.A. was just getting too expensive. I got a I bought a condo there that was so, way overpriced, and it was taking every dollar I made just to keep the lights on, and uh, and it was just stupid, you know. And and then uh, you know all the guys in the band uh, were slowly migrating out to Vegas because at that time the housing crisis had just started. Oh, and I know. Vegas was half price every I know. on sale. I know. Yeah, I know. I I made the same move, you know. <clears throat> yeah. I, I didn't have a lot of money back in 2011, but I said to my fiance, I said we are going to Vegas and taking advantage of this opportunity because there's foreclosures all the way down every street. Yeah. Take mm-hmm. your pick. Yeah. Take yeah. your pick. Yeah. They they're, they're giving houses away. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it's fascinating. You know what's the best stories, though? The Vince Neil Poison Tour. Those are the best stories oh, anybody ever tells. <laughs> the fighting, that. like the Vince Neil's beating up half of Poison and all that stuff was just, oh, wow. wow. It's, every time this story gets told, it's like, it, it's as if, like, there should have been, like, a documentary made about that tour. It must have just been nuts. Jason and you I know. are sworn to secrecy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how deep we either of us want to go into that. No, I don't. Uh, Give us I the Coles notes. Imagine. Yeah. It, it, I, t- <laughs> I, t- I will tell you that it was by far the most fun I've ever had playing in any band. Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. And just, that, that was, was most. Fun. You know why? Because Vince was never around. He would go and stay at the Ritz Carlton all day. Right. In a suite. Right. And and so it was just the tour bus. Brent, myself, and the bass player on the bus at the festival, at the show, all day. We were, So it was like we didn't have a singer. He would just come up. He would just show up at showtime, sing, and then <laughs> go back to the hotel. So it was like the three of us had our own little vacation on the bus. Yeah, exactly, and, you know, we yeah. kind of uh, – Brent and I were glued at the hip and kind of uh, didn't pay too much attention to the bass player. So he didn't know what to do, but he, Brent and I were like, it was our band, our bus. It was like, boy, we, we got <laughs> Dude, some our, too. Our, our awesome tour manager, Jack, Jack Carson, Park? he used to call us Terrence and Phillip, <laughs> which is as <laughs> <laughs> of a reference as you could get. Yeah. The Corsican twins. Yeah. The Corsican no, that was, yeah. that was South Park, right? Yeah, oh, that was good. Yeah, the two Canadian characters from the South Park. How, oh, okay. like, how long was that stint? Uh, at least like a, a summer and a half. Maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Too late. Couple, yeah. Well, the thing about when I got to Vince Neil gig, and I got to hand it to Brent again, you know, they really tried to lowball me financially. And Brent, having had already been in the gig for a year or two years, uh, said, don't accept anything lower than X because you know they're going to come at you with some bullshit number. Right. And I said, oh, oh okay, because, you know, I wanted the gig because it was just the next step mm-hmm. up for me. And and they knew that. And so they, you know, of course, they come in with some really ridiculous lowball offer. And he said, don't do it. They have the money. They can pay you. Just don't go lower than this. So I said, OK. So I I stood my ground. I said, I won't go lower than this. And they said, OK, well, you're still cheaper than Blando. So, uh <laughs> <laughs> well, then I want with Blando well, mix. Yeah, I'd like to yeah, point well, out really quickly that uh, Darren just threw out the term Coles notes, which we have to backtrack on for huh. the names. Is it? Coles notes is a reference to the term Cliff notes, but 
in Canada, there was a bookstore <laughs> called Coles. <laughs> well, they used to make their own version right. called Coles Notes. Of so course, you don't have to. Just, of course, I know exactly what you're talking I, about. It's right a away, Canadian I'm show, damn it. I'm making sure everybody else knows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It goes by and everybody goes like, did that guy just say Coles Notes? What is it? What is it? Yeah. I, love, yeah. I love hearing Canadianisms. It's my favorite thing. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, that's that's amazing. So then you went from Vince. How long was the time between? Then it went. Then you is that when you went to Hillary Duff? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> well, what had happened was um, that's a pretty sweet gig, though, for what it was at that time. You know, I mean, yeah, I, she she was she was uh, the you know the uh, the the biggest most popular pop star of the moment. Absolutely, yeah, and. Um, uh, I remember being really jealous, Jason, because you were playing these massive sold out arenas and I went to see you and I was like, holy shit, this is like super fandom. But you were kind of coming off the, uh, you know, well, let's just say that you were always smart at navigating opportunities and different gigs. And like every gig I saw you do, you kind of were still being yourself, but you kind of like were able to, you know, to, to say that you played with Hillary Duff, that says a lot, you know, about your ability in navigating a career in, in this business, right? Well, I, I'd like to think so. I, I mean, it was like this. I remember Vince Neil coming on the bus and talking to Nikki Six on the phone in the back. And then he'd come up to the front lounge and say, looks like there might be a Motley reunion. Yeah, right. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, okay, well, that's the end of this. I better start putting my Periscope up. Right. And the the and I got a phone call for Lizzie McGuire. Uh, right. Cuz she wasn't she wasn't a touring anything at the time. Mm. I was in her first version of the band. Wow. So she was an actress, right? Yeah, yeah, and of then, course. Yeah. And then the the mother who was very creative was like, "We got to get Hillary to also be a singer actress." Sure. So they assembled this record and it went double platinum or whatever with the mm -hmm. So Yesterday and all that stuff. So there and at the time it was very hip to have a, like a rock and roll pop female yeah. singer. Avril Lavigne, um, electric guitars. That was uh -huh. the presentation at the time. So um, so they were like, we want to kind of make her we want to give her like a rock and roll band. And right, then right. somebody said, "Well, I know the guy." Right. Uh, so, so I uh, so I went from Vince Neil to being the rock guy in Hillary Duff's band. But that's an amazing, like, to, to like, like Bram was saying, transitioning from one thing. It, it's all steps up, you know. I mean, you're you know heading into a whole different world, and the experiences you get in all these different things, they sort of are part of your uh, entire journey when you get to wherever you. You want to go, you know what I mean? It's the buddy it system, though. It's a recommendation because someone goes, yeah. hey, that's the right guy. That guy yeah. is awesome. And actually, yeah. you know, um, your movie, Jason, which is awesome, we've all seen it, Hired yeah, Guns, awesome. yeah. actually is sort of, I, I say the underlying current on that, too, is, is a lot to do with the buddy system and being ready for when someone recommends you for a gig. And mm -hmm. you clearly have navigated that of, you know, through several different types of um, gigs and opportunities where you were working for somebody else, in essence, right? Until you get to something that you can kind of call your own, having your own band and writing your own songs and, and you know, fast forward. Writing your own ticket, yeah. yeah. Yeah, being in charge of your own, yep. I mean, uh, my journey has been a very weird one, but... Um... But, you know, we all have the desire to continue to climb the ladder, whatever the ladder represents. I mean, it's it's human nature to want to grow and build and more and bigger and faster and better and mm -hmm. and more. You know, so, I mean, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to retire. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't this like, doesn't it feel like this is like retirement practice that we're going through right now? Like it's like it, it is. And I, I love it. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> for the first time in a long time, there's no impending deadline approaching. I know. Whether I know. doesn't it, it never used to matter. Like, if they say, "But you guys had three months off." Yes, yes, we did, and that was nice. But it was three months knowing that you're still going back to jail. Yeah. Like, so you're so you know it's like. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. yeah. 
and I don't mean to be derogatory about the touring thing, but but basically, touring is very very difficult. I don't think anyone could ever. That nobody, people that don't tour can never appreciate no. how physically demanding it is to change time zones, take flights, get up early, make lobby call, make the sound check, get back to the dressing room, get play the show, get showered, get back in your bunk, drive on a bumpy thing, blah, 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 with a guy snoring across the hall. Yeah, and get that, you know, and do it, do it, and then then you have a month off, and then you're going to do the same thing in Europe. In Europe, you start right out of the gate. When you go to Europe, you're wiped out because you're yeah. 11 hours up, upside down. So you begin yeah. a six-week tour mangled. Absolutely. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Jason, where, where do you see yourself if, if yeah, you could do it all over again and, and music wasn't on the table? Is there something else? I mean, you talked a little bit about doing the computer thing and, of course, but, you know, sneaking across the border and saying, hey, I'm going to go down there and make it. Any other passion? If you could, if I mean, not to take away from the musical side of things, but if you had to do something else, what would your choice be? I probably well, I probably would have been s scooped up in the computer realm somehow because I was, I, and I still am very much fascinated with computers and software, and um, not so much Skype. I'm kind of a nerd that way. So, I, <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I got it working on. You know, I had to go through three devices before it was the thing would work. <laughs> um, That's allowed. But see, the thing is, th but there's. Well, it doesn't matter. Anyway, but the thing is, yeah, I probably would have been sucked up into some company doing graphics or webs or... So, so to tie into, into the movie, was that, obviously, it was a take on the fact that you're a musician, or it was the love of film part of that, or is that something that you're looking to get into as well? Well, I, I mean, I, I love documentaries, and I think that yeah. I'll watch a documentary on anything, um, yeah. just because I love to learn. It's all information, you know, the ra raising the Kursk Russian submarine or whatever. Right. Oh, let's, yeah. see, let's see how that happened. Why did it <laughs> well, I mean, how they get it up off the ocean floor. I mean, hey, the anatomy of an, o an oil drill or something, I mean, whatever. I mean, right. I'll watch anything. Because I like, you, you don't get to see that stuff. So no. I always loved the Behind the Music series and i think everyone thought this is great we used to call it behind the cocaine because it just seemed like every <laughs> every story ended with somebody screwing the whole band up because they were involved in cocaine yeah but, exactly um, yeah. um but and i i didn't i didn't really i didn't really want to pursue a uh, a career in filmmaking so i didn't care if i pissed anyone off <laughs> I, right, I was gonna, right. I was gonna expose the dirt. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, and do you have any further interest in doing? Is there any other project like that that has come down the pipeline for you, or anything you're working on that might go that way? Well, film wise, I, that is. Yeah, there is actually. Um, now that we've had, now that we have nothing but time on our hands, uh, you know, I own the Hired Gun franchise um, right. solely, so there has been i got approached actually on the possibility of doing a uh series oh cool um so that's we're developing a series right now and i'm and i'm i'm doing it with um our our manager too who is a v extremely savvy businessman and will have all kinds of creative ideas on how to make it successful um cause it's that's very difficult idea. to do the creative part and then the administration and the marketing and the you know, sure. Yeah. All that stuff too. By the time that we, that movie was done, we were fried. We I had yeah. nothing, no gas in the tank to do anything with it to, uh, it needed to have the second phase handled by a marketing company or something like that, you know? Sure. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. Absolutely. That's fantastic. I mean, I, it's the kind of thing you probably could do volume two, three, four, five. It could go on forever. Really? I mean, well, yes, because there's never going to be a shortage of guys, you know, playing in bands and, and, and oh, different musicians. Oh, we've got stuff know. on there, man. I actually, we're, we're carving up the pilot right now for the series, and uh, it's the the pilot is the uh, Three Doors Down story with the guy who, I mean, they were all messed up, and the guy had vehicular manslaughter or whatever, went oh, to prison, okay. and it was a big, fat mess. Um, hmm. But... Um, yeah, we had 150 hours of interviews. Wow. wow. A lot of it didn't... And so the, if the movie was 90 minutes, I mean, mm -hmm. do the math on how much leftover interview there is there. 
like and we four talk, or five I mean, we other movies. Bob Estrin for four hours. We talked to David Foster yeah. for four hours. Alice Cooper. We talked to uh, Eric Singer for 16 yeah. hours. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he did uh, all the uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, that's no joke. <laughs> hey, it, if I remember correct, Jason, um, when we first, uh, as KISS fans, I remember introducing you to Eric, and that was kind of like a pinnacle at the time. You were like, hey, I'm all good. I just met Eric. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Singer. And I... And I completely fanboyed out on him, and he's like, okay, great. Get this guy away from me immediately. Yeah, but you know what? You, you left a great impression, and I, I would say for sure, because of your you know, relationship and knowing Eric, that he he absolutely recommended and brought you in. And, uh, you know, as as you know, Alice Cooper said in your movie how, you know, yeah. you were, were like a wanted guy. Alice saw you and, and, uh, and wanted you in the band. I didn't even know that story until I saw the interview in the movie. Really? That's amazing. I didn't even know that. I didn't, the whole bit about him bringing his daughter down to the theater in Phoenix and watching our show and saying, write that name down. I had no idea. Oh, I thought amazing. I, I, I mean, Eric, Eric, you and Eric were instrumental in getting me that gig. And then I had to go audition for Carrie Kelly. Again, it's always the buddy system. And you sort of like, yeah. you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I've worked with a lot of great people in bands. And usually when, you know, something else is coming around, you go, well, I just worked with this guy. This this is, uh, you know, this guy's great. The, re the refer it. referral care has more weight than anything. You can sit there going, I'm the guy, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. And they're like, yeah, fantastic. Right. But yeah. if somebody says, oh, yeah. I have the guy, because you know why? They have no stake in it. They, they have no, there's no motive other than to just be helpful. And they're not yeah. going to stick their reputation on the line or stick their neck out and recommend yeah. somebody that's going to make them look bad. Of course. Yeah. So no, it really that really is the whole essence. That's that's how I that's how I've been invited into every single thing. Is somebody says, "I know a guy, he can do it. He's a nice Canadian boy." <laughs> I remember I was on tour with uh, Theory of a Dead Man. We were on the road in like Providence, Rhode Island, yeah. and. Uh, Corey was playing the same uh, the same city that night with Kelly Clarkson. And I had just heard, like, oh, Kelly's got this awesome Canadian guitar player in her band, and he's from Moose Jaw. And I didn't know Corey at all, other than I had heard about this guy that was playing with Shania as well. So I actually went to the show just to go see Corey, because I was, like, impressed with, you know, Someone that came from the prairies that was that was in Shania and Kelly's band. So and and look where we are now. <laughs> All locked in our houses. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. All bored, senseless. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, that's what we always talk about too. That's a similar situation with you guys and the re recommendations within Slash. I mean, we always look at you know you've got the understudies you know to your left and right and um, you know at any given time you guys got a perfect fill in right. That's exactly of course. it. Yeah, well, that's yeah. how it works. <clears throat> that's how it works. Uh, that's how it works. People help people they like. That's true. And people that will make them look good. That's true. Yeah. And and we all know that nine times out of ten, there are really talented people who are a nightmare. You know what I mean? Like like who are they got a drug thing or they got some <clears throat> girlfriend Absolutely. who's a disaster or whatever. And and then there's guys who are just you know who can hang or good yep. players. Those guys always get well, called. Yeah, Jason and I were talking because we do keep in touch. And I was mentioning to Jason my, I call it the triple threat, which is, you know, it's as a musician, you've got, obviously, you got to be able to play your, your instrument. But, you know, the ability to actually convey yourself singing wise, not lead singer, not like Todd, but, you know, having the, the vocabulary of music, being able to communicate when writing songs. And, you know, just that. That's an advantage to being, you know, not just, well, I just only play guitar. So most of the guys right. that I, I like to write songs with and work in bands, which is everybody I'm talking to right now, is multifaceted and multi-talented at so many things. And I just sort of get more out of it because, you know, it just, it, to me, that's that's just what I gravitate to is guys who, who are good, you know, singers and, and musicians at the same time. Well, yeah, it's, uh, there's so many more factors involved than just like, I guess it depends on the gig, because some people hire a guy based on like, we just need you to play guitar. No, no, no. Don't think so much. Don't sing. Just play the guitar. Shut up. 
But when you want to be creative, you generally kind of lean towards guys who can. It's a lot. It must be a lot, lot harder things. than say 30, yeah. 35 years ago when it was just you know what does he look like and does he own his own mic, right? It's like you know, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it does matter too. I mean, you actually have to know how to you know fit in and and you know I remember you know Jason when we when we played with Vince you know it's like you got to kind of morph yourself into the gig a bit you know and and that's that's a big that's a big part of it. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Jason, yeah. given the fact that we're all sitting here talking about isolation, what, what have you been doing to keep yourself busy? Um, I'm just writing songs. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. That's that's the best uh, thing to do. Yeah, I think Jason wins the prize. You've wrote all the, the the biggest songs of all of us here, and I think you have like hit songs on the radio right now. So, uh, I, well, I assure you, he does. You're always on the radio. Jason wins. Jason wins. Yeah. Win. <laughs> well, I can't take full credit. I mean, there are, you know, this is the band. But I, somebody else had mentioned earlier that uh, doing, uh, it was um, Derry said that uh, uh, he likes to prepare. And I'm, I'm so insecure about being unprepared that I over prepare. So I never want to show up on day one of a record saying, what do you got? I don't know. What do you got? What do you got? You know, I, right. I, can't, that, I mean, I did that once with the band and it was a colossal nightmare for me. So I, I figured that'll never happen again. So I would, you know, if, if I knew we were doing a record in May, I would start writing in November. Right. You know, because right. I just figured the more you have available, the better the chances are you're going to whittle it down to your good ones. Of course, yeah. You know, because it's... Yeah. And they used to always make fun of me when I make this analogy with darts. Writing songs is like throwing darts. If they said you got eight seconds to hit ten bullseyes, yeah. what are the chances? But if you said right. you got eight months to get ten bullseyes, well, that's sure. no, pro no problem. Sounds yeah, like sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, so I would just, you know... You, I mean, you, you're not just you're just not going to be able to get ten bullseyes by writing ten songs. So I would always make sure I would try to come up with as much to pick through as possible, um, so that so that you had some uh, some some kind of insurance policy. Absolutely, you know? yeah. And uh, so and that's why I had this room built because I I hate working with people breathing over my shoulder. Right. Or people going, "What if you went there? What if you tried this? What if that went here?" What if that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what if yeah, you went home? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's easy. Um, so I, I that you know, so I always I'd like to document the ideas so that I can present them in a in a after I've after it's come out of my head, I can present it. Go, this is how it goes. Sure, you know, yeah. instead of having to explain it, you know, or yeah. hope that people would yeah, pursue it you know that is uh, always the easiest yeah we've kind of been in kemper mode with two kind of a lot of like fly dates and stuff you're, you're kemper guy right i'm i've got i've got one of everything matter of fact i probably have two of everything but um like behind me today's i don't know if it if i'm getting that on today i've got what exactly. over there i've got the 5150 88. stealth and an old jcm 800 and then if i come over here i've got I don't know if you can see that, but there's the camper over there. Yeah. Right in, the, in the rack. What gets and, the most use? Well, it's kind of, I, I do all my, all of the lead work I do, I mic up my Marshall. Uh, just because I've got it dialed in and it's, yeah, it just stays that way. But for rhythms and stuff, um, I've been using the camper because there's a lot of writing and re repetition with the rhythms and and it, i don't have to blast it in the house you know mm -hmm. plus you, i take the di out of the camper too it's simultaneously so i'm printing the the sound of the camper and the di and they conveniently both come out the back so it's a real nice package in a stereo track um i need to do that yeah it, and then you know you can even feed the DI back into the camper. I mean, it's just, it's a nice little package. And I've got, you know, 6 billion camper profiles that we've, I've traded with everybody. And so you can quickly find stuff, make it a favorite. Find, oh, there's a good one, make it a favorite. And then you can have all these, you know, somebody else did all the work. Right. Probably finding new things you know, now, staying home. The last time and I, you can, and because it's, 
Yeah, and you can change your mind later because you get the DI. Totally. So, you know. What were you saying, Corey? I was, I was just saying that the last time I recorded the DI clean signal to Pro Tools to reamp later, I ended up tweaking for like a week. Is that the right sound? Is that the right sound? Is that the right sound? Right. You might, There's like, something to be said about it. So, so I let, you know, now, now I just print it because I'm like, that's the sound. I'm going to use that. Let's move on, you know, because, yeah. you know, the tweaking is endless when you have, like you said, 60,000 Kemper profiles. It's like you can, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I understand that. There's that something it, to be said about committing to a sound like oh, that, that's it. Let's move on. <laughs> well, that I understand that's the what options. I would do. That's what I would do. I mean, your brother, uh, Kevin, would come over here and set and make sure that I was properly mic'd up for solos. And then I would he said, now you can touch this stuff. Don't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> like you can play with your pedals, but all this over here, don't touch any of this. So it, it's pretty, pretty funny. So I, it's still set that way. Like from six still years, still not, ago. still afraid to touch it. Yeah, <laughs> you know? nice. Yeah, nice. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not touch it because you know he, we got it. If you get it right, you leave it. You know. What do you mic oh, the cabinet? What do you mic the cabinet? I um I blend a. A Royer 121 ribbon with uh, SM57. Yeah, classic. I, I, I submix them before they get to the computer. Classic That's why sound. I can't touch it. The blends and, and yeah. EQs are all what, preset. What pre? Well, um, I've got a, I got some Vintech stuff here that we used. Uh, it's a basically Neve clone and the neat. I've got. Vintech preamps and Neve EQ. Yep. Okay, enough tech talk. Talk about the yeah. damn big steel punched out poison. Just kidding. Uh, I know, right? I know. It's I, got, like, I, I could I'm talk just to kidding. here all day long. I know. It's not very exciting. We all can, I know. I got one more question, though. Is that a prestige guitar behind you? Where? The other On shoulder. Your right. What, what is that? Guitar right there? This? Yeah, what is oh, that? That's, that's a BC Rich. Oh, wow. that headstock looks a lot like the Prestige. Okay, right. Can I see the headstock? I, I, Where's your yeah, Iceman? Uh, no, I I have three Icemans, by the way. It's really? insane. Of course you do. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. That's cool. Um, this is good because it's got this is tuned to be standard with a drop A. Oh wow. So I mean, I've I you know I don't even if I need. Um, a guitar for a tuning, I'll have, I won't even that fuck with the tuning of my guitars. I just grab another guitar because yeah. you know how once they settle, you don't yeah. want to keep going, you know, like that. Oh, I know. So if I'm looking for a certain, if I want to write something in a certain way, um, I do it. I just grab the guitar that is ready to go for that tuning. And, and what are you playing there right now? What kind of guitar is that? Oh, this is just a, a Yamaha they gave me uh, a while back. And, you know, the really high-quality really instruments the Yamaha. Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful... Yeah, I you mean, think I, of another company that makes pianos, guitars, <laughs> snowmobiles, motorbikes. motorcycles. Yeah. I know. Enough, right? uh, I always I say to any Yamaha... I always say to Yamaha, artists, like, oh, do you get a deal on a motorbike, or how does that work? Well, I... you know, hold I on don't think that works. I not. think it's different. I just did a, a video shoot for Yamaha acoustic guitars. And yeah, I asked, you right. did. Yeah. I asked those questions. I said, "Now, can you get a, a motorbike at a cheaper deal?" Or <laughs> just trying to work work some angles, and they're like, "No, actually, you can't." It it's doesn't a totally matter. different part of the company. They, totally, they, yeah, totally yeah. different uh, departments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I but think that's they, where. I was going to say they're the biggest uh, music company in the world. Yeah, yeah, really? it's like Roland. Yeah. They'll yeah. make like yeah. printers on uh, one yeah, side, but... and then on the other side, they're doing digital audio as well, right? <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, you have your own signature model, Jason, and Todd and Corey have their own signature model guitars. Yeah, I know. Uh, that, that, well, Gibson so. is, that Gibson is bitching, dude. So is there any further uh, variations on your guitar that you're planning to come up with or like different colors, different finishes, different? I don't know. I mean, Gibson reached out to me last week and uh, they just want to make sure that because the, the whole infrastructure there changed, the whole yeah. um, hierarchy, the management, the president, every, everything got flipped upside down. But for the better, it's yeah, pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah. yeah, and actually, you know that uh, the old guy, 
Henry was trying to replicate Yamaha and what Yamaha does right. with snow snowblowers, motorcycles, and <laughs> pianos, and you know, he, the he was trying to turn he was trying to turn Gibson into a Yamaha type brand. So he barbecues, up, <laughs> Gibson barbecues. Up, yeah, no, <laughs> they were they were buying up um, KRK, Onkyo. Uh, they did pan. They bought Panasonic, and they. Wow. they it, and uh, I don't mean to be critical, but they they he overextended and then couldn't pay all the debt back, and then they had to file Chapter Eleven. Yeah, and then they removed him. Mm. Yes, and now they're yeah. just all about guitars again, which is I think it's that's right. Bad. Well, it was um, it was he got Gibson he he bought Gibson for thirty million dollars in the late eighties when Gibson wasn't you know Gibson. At that period, it was all Kramer, Jackson, yeah. Floyd Rose, Superstrats, yeah. 80s guitars, right? So he bought Gibson it for $30 million because it just wasn't popular. It wasn't in vogue. And then when Slash came along, uh, and, Never heard of it. and it kind of changed back to, you know, Ronka, Ronka kind of rock and roll. Mm -hmm. um, then Gibson became very popular again. And he took the company from $30 million uh, to 600 million or something, you know. Wow. So he thought, I think he thought, I have the magic touch, you know, so I'm going to do that with everything. I'll buy Baldwin piano, I'll buy, fun, you know. Slingerland drums. Everything. Exactly, bought everything under the moon. If he could just then, find the slash at every one of those different things, he would have been able to do that, but it doesn't, yeah. It, doesn't it was really, it really, it really was just the luck of the, the fashion. Was, yeah. You're right just, because we all bought Les Pauls back then for next to nothing. I still have, a, you know, Les Pauls from back then. Yeah, and it was. It doesn't work like that anymore. <laughs> it was. Uh, it was not very popular in the '80s. Les Pauls no. were big, clunky, heavy. They weren't shredder guitars until, no. you know, later on. Yeah. Till later on, when the when yeah. the whole music, uh, popular music, changed into something else. You know. Yeah. Yeah. As it does. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this has been well, fantastic. Awesome. Was that the was that yeah. was that the Coles I believe it was, yeah. On Jason Hook? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean I could go on for days and days and days, but uh, I know. I know. It's the we're we barely scratched the surface. But that's well, part of the fun of it. I'll come on again if you guys want six months of course. from now and six months. Tell six all months. The story. <laughs> six weeks, six days. Just, just yeah, stay on. Just keep, I your, like uh, keep to your seat like Todd. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Think, uh, Jason, because you and Todd are so close, you can go over to Todd's house and uh, socially distance play his vintage Kiss pinball machine. And Jason already Todd, has that. Jason oh. already has a vintage one. Don't you have a vintage I, one? No, have, no. You I go to Jason's both. and you go and play the Jason. new one. Yeah, but I Jason has both. both. Yeah, he has them both. Yeah, he's just. Uh, yeah, I got the uh, red powder coated limited edition. Wow. Um, the new one. Yeah. Um, it was like eight grand. I think I've played it seven times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. A thousand dollars a pop. Yeah. yeah, I know. It's, I'm like, what? I, why I did I do this? Why did I buy <laughs> this? This is stupid. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's like, and it's too heavy to take upstairs, so it lives in my dining room. It's like it's totally out of place. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Mine's right here. It's right here. Yeah, and I you have it. three Icemen, and I do have what other original original stuff you PS, have. PS ten from seventy nine, mint condition. Ooh. Yeah, and nice. then I bought, and then I um, foolishly bought the cracked mirror uh, reissue. Oh, oh, well, it was nice. just really expensive, and I took it out on tour and played it just to get some pictures of me playing it but then it was pretty cool actually because people, yeah, people yeah, like, say, yeah. we shot a video for the awesome. a live video for our original song and todd you actually huh? have uh well our friend brad's uh iceman made a cameo in the video right yeah yeah it's uh he had it done in rhinestones so it was just oh, kind of oh, like okay. yeah I'll play this next yeah. thing i know it's filmed and it's in a video so there you go but yeah. they're, they're really fun guitars man you know it's like there's a guy named Nash Cato who plays in a band called Urge Overkill, and he plays exclusively Iceman's or PS10s, whatever you want to call them. And it just—he's got like gold tops with P90s. He's got like uh, silver sparkle with like tell, you know, like like Gretsch style pickups in it. And I'm like, 
it's just the coolest futuristic but like from the past guitar it's like really a cool guitar i would you know what's cool? I, would, I would have loved to have um made the ice bin my main thing but i found that the gibsons was a little chunkier sounding that's true and and the and the ice bin would be neck heavy a little bit ne or headstock heavy I'm so i'm so accustomed to neck heavy guitars like it's just yeah. kind of part of my routine is just holding up a guitar with your, the last your part arms of my body. a lot longer than but yeah i know so you're okay with that you're like six four uh, but todd you i think your your signature model guitar is actually there's a little bit of iceman in it your prestige yeah, signature model is there kind of like is. the updated cooler version it's always got a little bit of that i'm always a big fan of what what they would call you know kind of classic but radical like as if it was like something something futuristic but designed in like in the 70s like this is what guitars look like in the future and they don't <laughs> but, hold on one second i have a <clears throat> i have a zoom meeting at four, four. so i'm gonna have to transfer over to that 35 minutes late. but uh, let's do it let's do it anytime oh i have that mug awesome well uh, yeah no okay. and this is I this is about where our time ends like anyways, so we'd like to thank Jason for coming on the show. Yep. Tune in. Uh, Thanks, Jason. Tune in uh, Thanks, time, guys. time next uh, week, yeah, Tuesday the... at 2. And uh, Hey, who's our guest next week, Darren? Say the same thing to you guys. Who do we have queued up for next week? We have Mike Reno yes. from Loverboy. Nice. Doing a podcast. And we have okay, Pat gonna... Stewart, the drummer I'm... for Brian Adams. I gotta go. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, bye. buddy. Bye, Jason. Bye, Jason. Okay. See you later, See you guys. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Okay, bye, bye. Bye. So okay. I'm sorry. One more time, Mike Reno from Loverboy. Which right there, that's like that's almost like so every single for, like one an of entire show the right there. Bit. That's amazing. <laughs> oh fuck! Oh yeah, you, you know it. And who else? And uh, Pat. Uh, let me just check here. Make sure I'm not. Yeah, Pat Stewart. So he's and Pat Stewart. The drummer. he's a drummer. He plays, plays with drums Brian in a band called the, yeah. He played it. He plays in a band called The Odds, who are amazing from Canada. But he did play yeah. with Brian Adams back in the day. He played at Live Aid, Philadelphia, in 1985. I guess it was. Yeah, he's a legend That's and an amazing cool. guy. Amazing guy. Amazingly talented individual. And you know what? One of the funniest human beings you'll ever know. Those Odds nice guys guy. are hilarious. Really funny. Oh guys. yeah, for sure. All right. Well, looking forward to that one for sure. We'll uh, see Mike, everybody back. Good talk, guys. Next Tuesday. Good talk. Yeah. Thanks, everybody.